So let's talk about starting with the EIC. So the first thing you would do is you go to the company, go to the RV, and you should have gone to Markets Beta. All right, so this is the screenshot that you would need somewhere to the Starbucks assignment. So given this data, and again, we're looking at uh, <coughs> North American Airlines, all right, what would you say about the industry and its economic? How would you answer that question? Or how did you answer that question? Okay, what you find? All right, so the good part of that is she used numbers. So by using 0.93, I knew she was using the raw, which is the one we're using in this class. So again, benefit to using numbers, so good. And she answered the question, so it was a little less sensitive to the economy by showing the 0.3 versus one. So, great. But there's an and. There's one other thing that would have to be mentioned here. So what's the and, what she says is exactly right, but what's the other and? So the delta 0.93. What else do we have to do as part of our E assignment? The industry raw beta as well. So, what would you say about the industry raw beta of one? Yeah. So, basically, airlines are going to be sensitive to changes in the economy. Delta a little less so, but still pretty sensitive. So, obviously, we're going to care about what happens with the economy if we're analyzing the airline industry. And that's the point. I mean, if you wanted to go further, <clears throat> uh, somebody in the previous class talked about ECFC and how there was a 25% chance of recession. And that would play into the calculus about thinking about the airline industry because we did get into recessionary times. It would affect the airlines. In fact, uh, when's the last time we've had a recession in this country? Long time, right? So I'm just saying, if you look historically, we're, we're kind of due. I mean, it's, it's, you know, so basically not that the past repeats itself, but you usually don't see this long a period of extended growth. So in the next five years, you know, you could see a recession. And ultimately, that could affect the airlines. You know, that's going to matter. We talked about how fuel prices affect the airlines. You could be talking as part of your economic analysis, 20% of their cost is fuel. So what could be happening to the price of oil? That could be affecting them as well. So <clears throat> more than what I asked is the minimum to do the assignment, but nonetheless, things that you could consider as part of your economic analysis. Okay, questions about that? She did a good job. All right, let's talk about the I. So now we're going to move over to the industry analysis and the five forces. So again, on the RV, we go over to the custom tab. We would take our spread template of the ROIC from the latest filing against the WAC. And so again, using the <coughs> analyst curated for North America, <coughs> so we're all looking at the same data, what can we say about this? Is this an attractive industry? Yes or no? Kind of nodding yes. Why do you say yes? Because it has a positive spread and it's about like 4%. Yeah, so you looked at the difference between the 11.35 and the 771, came up with about a 4% spread. That's how we're defining that this is an attractive industry. Okay? So, given that statement, the next point is why. All right, and so the idea of the five forces is you're trying to say, given the five forces, what explains the attractiveness of the spread. Why is this an attractive industry? And then, how could that change over time? Well, let's start with the today. So a couple things I want you to, to be aware of. Number one, when we do five forces analysis for, I say, the Delta or the Starbucks assignment, we're doing it on airlines. <clears throat> so industry analysis is about the airline industry. It's not about an individual airline. That's competitive advantage. So industry, five forces, is the industry. So in this case, the airline industry is as defined here. Second, I want you to basically use data before you start your analysis because I need you to clear some of your biases, right? Because one of the problems is if I just said do airlines, you're like, oh, that's a horrible industry. You're kind of looking for excuses to say it's a horrible industry before you even show up. And by the way, right now it's not a horrible industry. Actually, uh, Warren Buffett had a great quote about the airline industry a number of years ago. He said, what's the fastest way to make 
a million dollars in the airline industry. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Spend a billion. And, and he hated airlines. He's like, these people will, are just awful. They're just terrible investments. If you're a Delta type HDS, which shows you the owners, institutional ownership, number one shareholder, 10% of Delta, Warren Buffett. Things change, right? Because the, the, the forces have changed. The nature of this business has changed. And he used to hate airlines. Now he loves them. Okay, that could change again in the future. So this is what I mean by we need to be data driven. We can't just use our biases. But the advantage of the tool that you have. So I want you to start every assignment. And I say use numbers. Yeah, I want to know you understand your number. But part of the other reason you use numbers is it helps us kind of de-bias our analysis. Because if you go into airlines with the idea that this is a terrible industry, well, it's actually not. And we have to explain why it's not using those five forces. And as I said, some of those forces matter more than others. So don't just assume they all have equal weight when you do your analysis. So given buyer, supplier, barriers to entry and exit, substitutes, um, rivalry, like what's going on that explains this positive spread that we see in the airline industry now? So what forces are helping this industry have a positive spread? Well, what did you guys talk about? And again, this is where BICO could be helpful. This is where IBIS could be helpful. Other industry research reports could be helpful. Site. But nonetheless, what, what about this industry's helping? Yeah. It's consolidated over recent years with less competitors means the prices can be higher. Okay, so which of the forces would that then impact? It would be competitors, the rivalry. All right, so there's less rivalry because they're, they're now acting more like an oligopoly. So a decade ago, there were 10 large U.S. airlines. Now there's four. Four airlines are like 80% of all capacity. And as a result of that, there's just not as much competition. And oh, by the way, those planes are about 90% full. So why do I need to compete on price? If there's not that many choices that you have and the planes are already kind of full to begin with. So this is not a price intensive industry. And it's even worse because they all have their fortress hubs. You know, so again, here's an example. So yesterday, my girlfriend decided we were going to Mardi Gras. Okay, hadn't been to Mardi Gras before. And you'll learn later in life, you don't always get to make the choices in a relationship. So we're three weeks out. And I'll tell you, going three weeks out to Mardi Gras, not a wise financial decision. So I start looking for the airline flights, and there's not many that go to New Orleans from the DC area. It's like a thousand dollars, okay? Because all the flights are full, and there's not that many flights. And so that's the point. We don't have the choice that we used to. It's not like there's like ten different airlines flying five flights a day between DC and New Orleans. And the side of town I live on, BWI, same thing. Like. There's not that many other flights if you don't want to fly Southwest. So you're kind of stuck on the airlines that you're looking at. So what I'm saying is, just anecdotally, the point he's making is that the rivalry is actually not as intense as you would expect it to be, and that's kind of helping the industry. In fact, he actually spilled over into the power of the buyers. We, the customers, the buyers, have lost a lot of our power because there's not as much choice. And these airlines are not fighting it out on price. They're fighting it out on other features. Matter of fact, they're all charging us fees. That's another problem we all have with the airlines, is that they all charge bag fees. They all charge seat fees. They all charge $200 change fees now. So and it's not like one doesn't do a fee, the others don't follow, with the exception of Southwest. And I have bad news for you. I, I know from a, a former employee of Southwest Airlines that this year is the year the bag fees are going to start on Southwest. Because they've realized it's not helping them. As much as they they basically give you the free bags, you still go fly somebody else because they have a lower fare. And unfortunately, the bag fees are hurting them financially compared to the peers, so it looks like this is the year they're going to throw in the towel and start charging fees. But regardless, either way, for the rest of the industry, it's a fee-driven industry, and they're not fighting on fees. So what I'm saying is we don't have a lot of power. This Forger's Hub, they've eliminated some choices. They're keeping the planes relatively full. Not a lot of competition. I'm not saying that every now and then, but it's very regional. And that tends to help the airlines. So relatively low buyer power, but in their papers, high to the industry spread in the buyers, high to the industry spread in the rivalry. What about substitutes? 
Are substitutes hurting the airlines? Let me ask you this. If you had to go from Dulles or BWI to New Orleans, how are you going to get there? Think I'm going to drive? Realistically, the average person is going to drive 20 hours? Maybe a college student. <laughs> I'm too old for that. But I'm just saying, you know, for these airlines, medium to long distance, there's not a lot of choice. All right? Not taking Amtrak. Yeah, that's not going to happen either. Probably not taking a bus. All right, does the bus service even go long distance? Does Greyhound exist anymore? I don't even know. I know mean, they have like pieces of the Northeast Corridor, but like, can you go co coast to coast with Greyhound? And that's the point. I'd fly. Yeah. So as I'm saying, like, the substitutes are really not that strong to the airlines, particularly when you go medium long distance in this country. I think that benefits them, and that's probably another reason why the spreads have been improving over time. What else affects the airlines? What about supplier power? Who are the key suppliers to airlines? Just types. What industry supplies them? Well, Boeing and Airbus, we talked about them last week. Now, we said that they actually, we did their analysis, we said they have a lot of power because there's only two of them. But is that killing the airline industry's profitability? Now, it's probably not helping it, but it's not seem to be hurting it. 20% of an airline's cost is fuel. Does the airlines have power over the oil and gas companies? No. So what's interesting is the suppliers actually have a lot of power, but right now it's not hurting the industry. Okay, so the way I want you to think about in your paper is that, look, suppliers actually do have a lot of power, but right now the power is not hurting the spread. And so therefore, it's actually helping the spread. Low oil prices are actually really helping the industry. Right. However, asterisk, if oil prices six months shoot up, nothing the airlines can do. That's the point about supplier power. It's, they can't really influence oil prices, and they're kind of at the mercy. But right now, the low oil prices are actually benefiting the industry. Even though it's a high power, it's still benefiting the industry today. So this is kind of a situational analysis. Yes? Uh, SPLC. Um, the other one would be barriers to entry and exit. Easy to do a startup airline? I, I think that kind of answers its own question. It's very difficult for new airlines to pop up. And so there's the point. You kind of work through the forces. Kind of makes sense why this airline industry right now is attractive. And, that's, and you'd be writing it up and explaining this. So then the real question, that's the easy part. And again, this is evidence-based. Right? You'd use your research to do so. Write it out. There's nothing wrong with using personal anecdotes. All right, but I don't want you to write and base your entire paper on personal anecdotes. Okay? So what I just said is, look, look, I did my own travel. I'm seeing some things. In fact, here's another thing about rivalry. If you ever want to do, look at this up right now. Look up a hotel in New Orleans for Mardi Gras in the French Quarter. Oh, my God. Like, La Quinta is $500 a night. Freaking La Quinta. Right? Because the, all the hotels are sold out. they got a couple rooms left. And there's not much supply and a lot of demand and price skyrockets. It's a metaphor for what I'm seeing in the industry. So what I'm saying is I'm not going to base my entire analysis on that, but it kind of infers something I might be wanting to look at to see if there's real evidence in the real world. These are called weak signals, by the way. And we're always looking at weak signals. Same thing about Chipotle. I'm sure if you ever went to lunch a couple of years ago in Chipotle, the lines were, were like so long it would almost be like not worth it. Now you go in the middle of lunch hour, walk right up to the counter. There's nobody there. Like, that, that shows Chipotle's got some issues, right? And the E. coli thing really did hurt it. And what I'm saying is you can actually see that in its numbers. So don't be afraid to use your own information. But the flip side is that's not how you're justifying your papers. You're then looking for the actual evidence to support that. Now, let's go back. Five forces in the future. <clears throat> what I care about is in five years is the spread going to be about like this. And to be honest with you, you can't give me a number. If you give me a number, I mean, how'd you make up that number? You just made it up. So what I want you to do is rather than making up a number, I want you to use the five forces to tell me what that general spread's going to look like. Because if the forces don't change, the spread's probably going to be about 4 or 4.5%, somewhere in that range. If the forces improve, then the spread could be even higher. If the forces get worse, then the spread could go potentially down to zero or negative. So that's the point. Are any of those five forces as we just talked about, going to change in the next five years? And if so, which, which would change?
What would you say about that? Yeah. Well, at least in the short term, uh, firepower is going to go up. So I guess that would make the spread different. Okay. So why? Like, what about the buyer power is going to change? Airlines are increasing capacity, and that's outweighing demand. Ah, so that actually could start to change things. So if they do increase capacity, and that also would affect the second force. If they start adding a bunch of planes and more seats, what other force would that impact? Rivalry. rivalry. So if rivalry actually changes, and they lose the discipline of the oligopoly, and they start adding a bunch of capacity and fighting for market share, that could start to change the things, and that could swing some of the power back to us and hurt the spread. Now, is that going to happen? I don't know. But that's the point about the future. That's something to be talking about, and that if he, if he has some data to support that, I think the analysts are probably fretting over that right now. Okay, Good for you, bad for the airlines. Good. I like that example. What else? What else could change realistically? about the five forces. That's the other point. You gotta be realistic. Yeah. In the next five years, is that gonna exist? Okay. So I'm saying in the five year period, we that's back to realistic. Like alternative forms of transportation, maybe. Like Elon Musk may get that hyperloop going. But five years from now, is that really going to affect my trip to New Orleans? So again, I just want you to be somewhat realistic about these. So the transporter has not yet been invented. Okay, the Hyperloop's not going to be here in mass yet. In the U.S. we're probably not going to have high-speed trains everywhere in the next five years. Even if the, the government, you know, approved it all today, it'd take more than five years to build. And they can't even build a, a rail line to Dulles Airport, much less high-speed across the country. Okay. This uh, whatever the one they're trying to build now. What's the what's the one going through campus? The purple line is going to take forever. So I'm just saying, we start thinking about five years. That's probably longer term than that. But what else could affect in the five years? Might affect airlines. Yeah. It's really realistic, but that if, if the expectation looks more realistic to five years, that change something is realistic. Like Absolutely. Well, here's something that I I didn't think about that they brought up in the last class: Green New Deal. I know some people are shaking at it, and I will shake my head too, because it scares the hell out of me. I was like, this, the people are not serious, but obviously they might be. And if the Democrats actually pass some of the crazy stuff, like eliminating air travel in the next 10 years, I'm not saying they're going to go there, but what if the regulatory environment gets very unfavorable and fuel taxes get higher and people start having carbon credits and all these taxes, that could actually start affecting the industry. And it could affect some of the changes in the industry. So again, you might have a different view on whether or not that happens, and you'd have to put that in your paper, but that's a, at least something I can't completely be dismissive of. Right? No matter how horrifying I think that would personally be, right? I can't dismiss that that couldn't affect the airline industry in some way. Okay? What else? What else could realistically happen in the forces? Because you're going to be doing the same thing for Starbucks. And you got to come up with your answer. And if the answer maybe is no, then maybe based on this information, you say, you know what? I still think they're going to have a pretty high spread in five years as an industry. That's okay. You can say not much is going to change. That's Warren Buffett's view, by the way. Warren Buffett doesn't see the, the industry worsening in the next five years. That's why he owns so much of Delta. And he actually is one of United's largest shareholders and one of American's largest shareholders. He became one of the largest shareholders of all of the major airlines because he really likes airlines, right? And that was just a different view a few years ago. So again, got to write our five forces. By the way, and this is important, instead of Delta, if I had said China, China Eastern Airlines, These are airlines in China today. So this is the other important thing I want to illustrate. If I said to do a five forces on the airlines, the airlines in the U.S. and the airlines in China are in a completely different environment, right? Because in China, the barriers to entry 
are not nearly as high. All these airlines are pretty much startups. All these airlines are low-cost budget airlines. Right? All these airlines have invested a huge amount of capacity and are trying to drive market share right now. It's a different market. And therefore, the five forces, even if it's the same industry, is actually completely different, and we would have to explain this. So even though we're doing airlines, where you are in the world might, even for the five forces, give you a different answer. That's why I go back to it's so important to use data first to do your analysis. Because if you use the U.S. airline industry as a proxy for the rest of the world, you would completely miss what's going on in China. In fact, even when you think about substitutes, they do have high-speed rail in China. That is a legitimate long-distance substitute to airlines that we don't have here in the United States. So as I'm saying, different market condition, different forces. Okay, So just be aware of that as you're doing these exercises. That's why these comp groups are actually so important. Because if you don't pick a representative comp group, you're going to miss what's going on in your industry. Right? And that's why, also, it's actually harder to do what looks like an easy exercise. Right? You want to know why? Here's why. GE. If I said do the industry for GE, how do you do that? What's their industry? They're a conglomerate. Which, which business do you do? See, there's the problem. Is that, this is what I've said, it's, like it's, it's actually a more difficult exercise in the real world because you have these multi-business companies that are in completely different industries and they become much more difficult to analyze. And I was working a couple of years ago with, for a long time with a company called Ingersoll Rand. They're, they basically have air conditioners, they have train, but then they have club car. They make golf carts. Like air conditioning and golf carts, they're not the same thing. They also make locks, like the swipey locks for doors and stuff like that. Those are the three businesses, commercial locks, golf carts, and air conditioners. Right? Try finding peer groups for that, right? because there are multiple segments. So part of the challenge of this analysis is actually that it's simple to do the analysis. It's actually hard to actually define industries. So for your, your points, I picked industries, airlines, you know, Starbucks, fast casual food, that are pretty straightforward. But there are some nuances here we're going to have to start getting into that this actually does get a little messy as we go on. So I will mention that part. But let's talk about the final piece of this. So again, with the U.S., with Delta, general thought, attractive industry because of positive spread, 11.35 versus 7.71, five forces that explain it, not too much change in those forces for reasons we talked about in the next five years, so they're probably still going to have a pretty positive spread in the next five years. Competitive advantage. Does Delta have a competitive advantage? How do we know? What are you looking at to say that Delta has a competitive advantage? What are you guys looking at? What, what numbers? Give me numbers. Yeah, the 14.38 minus the seven and a half is about, call that seven round off. Industry about four, so higher spread than the industry. And again, that's why you got to use numbers. Can more than one company have competitive advantage? Does Hawaiian Airlines have competitive advantage? Yes. Does United Airlines demonstrate competitive advantage? Yes. So more than one company can actually have competitive advantage. Don't confuse five forces and competitive advantage. When you're doing five forces, it's not about Delta. Five Forces is about the industry it's in. Five Forces is not about Starbucks. Five Forces is about fast casual food. Okay? Competitive advantage is about the company. That's the C. So the next piece is why. Why does Delta have better spread than its peers? Did anybody get that far in your analysis and what you looked at? Why is Delta doing better than its peers? Yeah. 
It's indirectly one of the reasons why, and by the way, I'll be back. I'm not going to actually be in New Orleans for Mardi Gras because we have class on Monday. So I'll be back Sunday. So I won't be there for Fat Tuesday. <clears throat> but uh, long story short, I've been flying Delta for a long time. And domestically, especially out of BWI, they fly MD-80s and MD-88s. The last MD-88 was manufactured in 1983. Those planes are older than you are. So here's the thing. Why does Delta have planes that are so old? Yeah. Yeah, they're fully depreciated assets. So basically, part of their strategy is to fly old planes until they fall out of the sky and people die. And they haven't done that yet, so they just keep buying old planes. Now, that doesn't mean they don't upgrade the interiors, which are actually kind of nice, but the planes itself are over 30 years old. And they have the oldest age fleet of the airline industry. And that has given them not a fuel advantage, but an ROI advantage, because they don't have new planes where some of the other airlines have much more new expensive planes. It's also why China has terrible ROI, because China's all new planes. Delta is old planes. In fact, Delta's more than happy to buy other people's old planes and put them into service. Okay, It's their strategy. So they feel that they actually have a maintenance competitive advantage. They think they're so good at maintaining these old planes that they can fly them forever. Okay, Now eventually, they'll eventually retire them. They did with like the 727s one day. right? But nonetheless, they fly all planes. Now, interestingly, they have some very brand new planes for international routes, but a lot of their domestic planes are very old, and that's given them an ROI advantage. Will that last long term? I don't know, because eventually those planes are going to have to be replaced. But right now, at least it gives them a financial advantage because they just don't have the eye of some of the other airlines which have newer planes. So, nonetheless, that's actually one of the things about Delta. The other thing about Delta is they have one of the highest percentage of business class travelers. And they cater those business class travelers. And that gives them more premium customers, more premium prices for these full planes, and that also helps their financial part of the balance sheet. So those two things are probably why they're outperforming their peers right now. So the question is, could that change in five years? Here's what I'd be worried about. What, what should I be worried about? Go back to what you said about how you can be business class traveler for the Americans. There we go. So they're fighting with Americans, we probably want, and United is trying to catch up. We talked about that last week. So that could add some more competition, which could actually erode their business class advantage. What's the other thing I'd be worried about in the next five years for Delta, potentially? That they gotta buy a bunch of new planes. That these old planes eventually do have to get replaced, and that could happen in a five year window. And if it does, that could completely change their own life. Not saying it will, but things we need to be sensitive to. So that's the point. I can't say with 100% certainty, so you might come up with a slightly different answer. You're like, nah, they're fine with their old planes. They'll run another 20 years. And they're perfectly safe. Because, of course, the government wouldn't let an unsafe plane fly. So, but nonetheless. And by the way, I mean, we're in an unprecedented precedent age of airline safety. Seriously. And that's a good thing for, for air travel and people. So we don't want people to have problems. But that's the point. Like, they're very good at, at maintenance. They're very good at safety. So that's a question. If that continues, can they rely on the older planes for a longer period of time? But at some point, they're eventually going to probably have to replace them. So long story short, you have to make some calls, and you have to make some judgments. And again, this is a process exercise. There's no 100% right or wrong, but you have to basically talk about that as part of your homework three, and in case your example, you do it with Starbucks. Turn in your screenshots for that. Make sure you're always referring to numbers in every assignment. If you use data, it's okay to use this. Just remember, just reference what you use. Don't plagiarize, okay? And this is an individual part of the assignment. You've got some other group assignments to work on. So again, Wednesday, you have class time to finish your Bloomberg certification, to work on the trading sim, to work on group case one, and potentially to work on homework three, depending on the time of day. And again, we'll have our next lecture a week from today, okay? Everybody have a good day.